right, we are back for the final session of the day. And there is Wendy. Let's see if other people are coming in. Yep, slowly but surely the room is filling up. I see Toddy. I see William is back. And of course, there's Peter Dillon. Thanks so much, everybody, for, for joining us. <clears throat> so glad to have you back here, um, everyone. And I'm glad to be here with my pal Jonathan Rock. We both are have like some little cold bug, apparently. Yeah, it's the raspy show. <laughs> it's the raspy show. And so um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to actually getting off screen so I don't have to talk anymore. But I do want to read Jonathan's wonderful um, bio. J-Rock is a hardworking schlub. He runs an LMS, creates e-learning with Storyline 360, and answers questions regulators have about the training program at his site. He thinks the version... <laughs> he thinks... <laughs> I love it that you have to read this. <laughs> he thinks the version of D&D he plays is real and yours is fake. <laughs> you can win at D&D. Don't read any SF and F written after 1980. So, um, All right, do yes, it. hey, Rock, thank you so much for doing this. Um, he Jonathan has actually at the tldc.com, our website, the, there. Um, he, he's been in multiple sessions that we've done, so just search him on there if you want to. If you want to watch more of his entertaining stuff, and yeah, Ken, you Kim was gonna have a problem with that last day. Uh oh, Kim's bringing up Sanderson. I get into my presentation, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hide myself, and I want to just thank everybody for being here for today. Remember, tomorrow we have at least five more sessions. So, um, with that. Um, J Rock, I'm gonna let you take it away. All right. Yeah, you better it. leave after all that stuff you just said, man. Real D and D. All right, guys, how is it going? I'm not sure I'm gonna get all of this out because I got a lot of stuff in my head, and I'm passionate about all of it. And um, I have been going down the D and D bunny trail, so um, I've, I've gone to some weird places, and I'm here to bring it all for you, so you don't have to go crazy like I did, right? <clears throat> So uh, I noticed that Gagne and Gygax both have the, the G's in the same place in the name. And I was like, oh, cool, Wordle. So that's kind of why I did this. Um, uh, I'm going to assume most of the people on this call are familiar with learning and development. And so this presentation is going to be more on the D&D side of things, but it is going to be still relevant. So in the chat, let's hear your answer. What was the best e-learning you ever took? And what made it different from the worst? <clears throat> Anyone recall the best e-learning they ever took? What was good about it? Oh, I'll wait. Light us up. Come on, let's go. Or is it possible that nobody has ever had a good e-learning experience? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Tom says it ended quickly. Nicholas says it let me make choices, but I always learned. <clears throat> Ooh, interesting, Don. Role-playing branching scenarios. That's awesome. Uh, Peter says the best for me was the worst. I learned more about how not to do it. Um, and William says, of course, on resiliency, the interactivity was phenomenal. So role-playing interactivity. Hmm. Let's store those nuggets away. Uh, Vanessa said, I came away buzzing with lots of ideas. That's that's awesome. How many of us can say that, right? Uh, Jennifer says, nothing has really stuck with me except recent things, a simulation approach. Simulationism. Okay, another nugget to set aside for later. Leanne said, told a story. Are you leading the witness? Do you know this is a D&D &D presentation? And that's why you said that, Leanne. <laughs> I don't need any help. Dang it. I'm going to offend everybody all on my own. Uh, Wendy says it was a compliance training. Harassment, maybe. Made choices based on live scenarios. Yeah. Uh, Jacob says best e-learning was Dr. Luke Hobson's Instructional Design Institute, Building Community and Case Studies. Tristan Sylvester, a scenario-based safety course that had us making decisions about what to do. It used our real facility and policies. Um, Kim asked, does the first few levels of plants versus zombies count? Well, I, I'd say you could make the case that the beginning levels of any video game are have a tutorial nature, right? I mean, they don't really 
teach you anything other than how to play themselves, right? Like Super Mario Brothers, the first level teaches you how to play, how to jump, <laughs> how not to die. Uh, Nicholas Brown says, games make the best learning experiences. And Wendy has also shown some love for plants versus zombies. Well, for me, <clears throat> the best ones that I can recall, one of them is called Broken Coworker. Uh, let me see it in the chat if you guys have, have gone through this or know this example. Um, it is a branched path scenario wherein you have to see this poor schmuck in the uh, blue shirt. You got to try and uh, guide him through uh, interactions with this crazy lady that he happens to work with who has boundaries issues. And so if you do a good job in the scenario, he stays there and he keeps working. If not, he gets outraged and quits. Right. So it's not it's not just telling you a bunch of information. It's not tell, 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 test like what most of our of our e-learning experiences, conventional e-learning is we give them all the information and then we quiz them on their short term memory. Right. I may be a little bit jaded because most of the stuff I do is compliance training. And so um, you can make the, the case that, you know, that's the worst kind of e-learning there is. I happen to think it's the best because there's freedom to do gaming type stuff. Um, but the one that really got me going, even before I saw Broken Coworker, was um, Connect with Haji Kamal. Has anyone played this one? Uh, Don says, it's it's the best. You can only go up. I may be referring to another, um, another comment up there. Kim. Kim did play Haji Kamal. It was Haji Kamal was um, for the army. Kathy Moore of Mappet fame put this encounter together. I believe you can still, if you if you Google it, somebody Google encounter or connect with Haji Kamal and put the link in the chat. If people want to play it for themselves, this e-learning opened a door for me because right before I took it out of curiosity on my own, I had had I taken one for work that I had to take. And it was one of those compliance cover your butt trainings. And, I, and I've told the story on TD, TLDC before. So I'll try and tell it quick just in case. <clears throat> um, yep, there it is. Peter Dillon's World Warfighter. And uh, Kathy's blog explains how they built it. So uh, perfect. Thanks for that, Luis. Um, so where was I going? Oh, I took a normal one. I had a quiz question. I answered the question correctly. And the, the feedback slide that popped up was like this big indigestible chunk of info dump explaining why I got it right. Now, why were they doing that? Obviously, they wanted to make sure, well, what if he guessed? Let's tell him again just to make sure he knows it. Let's cover our butts. And it insults your intelligence. And I didn't read it. I just I knew I got it right. I know I got it right. I clicked and it closed it. However, when I played Encounter with Haji Kamal, I am immediately put into a situation. They don't give you any advice. They just say, you are advising a young lieutenant on his first deployment. He's got two sergeants to give him advice. You have to tell him what to do. He needs to move his troops across Haji Kamal's land. And you need his permission to do that. And so you're going to go meet with him. You're going to connect with Haji Kamal. And it's a dialogue. And depending on the things that you notice on the way, the things that you bring up and the way you respond to like him offering you chai and that kind of thing, um, you will either have the best outcome, you'll have a somewhat good, somewhat bad, or he'll kick you off his land. And all of the extra need to know it stuff is just kind of in the corner. If you would you like to know more, you can click on it and then read more if you want it. But if you don't want it, you can just make your choices. And guess what? Hey, presto, you get your results and you get your consequences. And the thing about that learning was fun for me because it didn't insult my intelligence and engaged it. And after I played through the first time in one, I decided to go back and play through and, and make all the worst decisions because I wanted to see what happened. And it struck me, same exact scenario, one e-learning is worried that I got it right because I guessed and wanted to over explain it to me and I could not be bothered. I skipped past it. The other scenario, just let me face my consequences. And I was so intrigued by the way it was built that on my own, I took it multiple times. I purposefully went and read everything. And it struck me that there is something powerful about player agency, right? <clears throat> so 
Did you know that the Dungeons and Dragons community is divided on the best way to play? You can say, yes, I knew that in the chat or no, everybody I know plays the same version and it is awesome. Yes, Nicholas. Yes, really. Kim knew that. <laughs> Jennifer knew that. All right. So um, the conventional way to play Dungeons and Dragons, the edition that is hot right now is called Fifth Edition. And they are ramping up to bring it to D&D 1. Right? <laughs> Julia says, well, humans going to disagree on something every day. Yes, especially on Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn is for getting hired. Twitter is for getting fired. <laughs> but a lot of people that are in the scene are on Twitter. So you can, um, I don't know, make of that what you will. Uh, the most conventional way, and probably I think on uh, Friday, uh, you, the, the the people that played, Luis, you can correct me if I'm wrong. They played fifth edition, right? Oh, William, I'm sorry. I'm showing my age. Uh, once upon a time, X was called Twitter. Uh, now it's called X. You don't tweet, you zeet now. Oh, yeah, Wendy says Twix. All right, so yes, they're playing fifth edition. <clears throat> fifth edition didn't just spring fully formed from the head of Zeus. Uh, there's a history, and we're going to get into it. Uh, but uh, the thing, and I and I've got a DM in the chat here. Where where do you go, Tom? Tom McDowell has actually played with me. I would still be playing in his campaign if it wasn't like right when my family has dinner because of um because of you know time zone schedules and stuff. Uh, but Tom McDowell, uh, we I don't know if you're still using Fifth Edition or if that campaign is still going, man. Um, yeah, sort those priorities, dude. Yeah. You let dinner with your family get in the way of D&D. &D. Um, and man, I really hope that you don't get enraged, but you probably will. I'm probably going to make everybody mad with this presentation. So let's just do it. <clears throat> um, the conventional way that D&D &D is played right now, um, Wizards of the Coast is the company that owns them. Um, and they are in turn owned by Hasbro. Uh, used to be TSR, Tactical Studies Review. And then, um, then uh, Wizards of the Coast or WotC, make of that rhyme what you will, uh, purchased it and then Hasbro bought them. Uh, the conventional is the DM as a storyteller. And I don't think Tom would disagree with me on that one. I think that he would say that for him as a dungeon master, the story is the highest, is the ultimate. Um, and he is a smart guy, and he spends a lot of time outside of our play sessions prepping the story and figuring out who are the main players and what's happening. And so as the players go along, they discover the story um, as they interact with these interesting people that he's peopled his world with, right? But, and maybe I'm reading you wrong, Tom. Totally straighten me out on this if, I'm, if I screw any of this up, right? All of you, feel free to fight me. I am not... Um, I'm not handing down wisdom from on high. I'm telling you my take on this and I'm probably wrong. <laughs> right. Uh, but one of the things about that style is um, you will hear DMs get absolutely destroyed over trying to spend a lot of time building up all of these just brilliant story moments. And um it's got like denouement. It's got the whole character arc. It's got everything. They're weaving in stuff from your backstory that you told them when you first started that you don't even remember and you haven't even read your sheet since then. And they're putting these pieces together. And time after time, you'll see memes about how the DM, like there's like a tunnel and there's a car just like crashed up to the side of it. And then like the tunnel says the DM's plan and the, the truck says the player's plan, right? So, um... When we when we talk about the and I, I don't want to these are some broad brushes I'm I'm painting. You can play fifth edition without be, it being a railroad, but like a lot of the fifth edition stuff is um, let me see. Like I got this one. This is Curse of Strahd. This is an adventure. Um, I play with dads. We never play. We like play twice a year. It would take us so long to get through all of this stuff. And like, oops, <laughs> monster cards help too. It makes the game go a little faster. Um, anyway, takes a long time to get through it. And we don't play very often. And then the DM has to remember where they are. So if you're not making up your own stuff like Tom is, if you're running a module, 
you've got all this stuff in your memory, in your RAM that you're trying to um, trying to recall. And man, wouldn't it just be easier if the players just played along, right? So little things that they may do that try to jerk the wheel off the story. You're like, all right, Ryan Johnson, no, no, this is what we set up. <laughs> Let's go back on this work. That was a that was a, a cross nerd nation. They're talking about Star Wars. I apologize for that. Um, but man, the the books look amazing. <clears throat> They've got really polished art on the cover and throughout. I mean, look at these maps. Um, very just evocative stuff, right? So that's the left side. Conventional, Wizards of the Coast, DM is the storyteller. They say 5e has a DM problem because there is not as many people that can... DM it, it's intimidating if you're starting off and you don't know what you're doing. Now, the, the game, like if you read the player's handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide, they give you good advice to help you out. <clears throat> but it is there is a lot on the DM in the conventional style. Um, but what you don't may not realize is that 5th edition was actually an attempt to bring it back closer to what it was. Um, this The one on my right is the old school revival, OSR. Some people say old school renaissance. And this came about right around the time that um, fourth edition hit. And fourth edition was, um, there are some people that love that edition and I'm not here to yuck your yum, but there were a lot of people that said fourth edition is not d and it is, it is an attempt to make the, the, the game that we all grew up loving a, uh, a video game. And so this, this old school renaissance was kind of born out of people's <clears throat> unsatisfied desires with fourth edition. And so what you have is third party clones of the original titles, right? Like old school essentials, classic fantasy. Uh, that is a retread of BX, basic expert edition Dungeons and Dragons. There's one that came out called Osric. Came out for free. You can download the whole game for free online. Um, I can't remember what all it stands for. Old school. It basically it was first edition rules that um, at the time you could not get the original rule sets unless you went on eBay and bought the original books. Um, <clears throat> it was either fourth edition or whatever you could cobble together. And copyright wise, you cannot copyright game rules. You can copyright. Oh, Don doesn't like Thaco. I'm a Thaco appreciator, but you guys already knew I was going to start start some fires. So um, I was having problems with fifth edition when I was when I was get lucky enough to play it. Because um, I was as the DM, I was trying to remember everything that was going on. We couldn't play every time. Sometimes some of the guys could make it and others couldn't. And then I'm like, we're halfway through a dungeon and I got a dude here that either is going to teleport away because his player's not here, or we're just going to have to run him like some mindless stooge and he might get killed while the guy's not here. You know what I mean? So uh, that was weird on me. So I started looking into the OSR, the old school Renaissance. And the problem there that I found was there is some amazing, if you go on drive through RPG, they have some amazing modules. And there are um, two resources that when I was in my OSR phase, I was really into one of them was uh, questing beast. He is a he is a YouTuber um, who reviews old school Renaissance style games and modules. And the other is a guy named Bryce Lynch who has a blog called Ten Foot Pole, where he reviews old school Renaissance modules. And I got all into that, and I was like, maybe this is what I've been looking for. <laughs> and I found that I just bought a yard of books, and I never got to play them. Right. So of these two, which way is best? Oh, no, there's um, there's another one that showed up um, about this time last year. Um, I started seeing this hashtag on Twitter called the bro SR. Right. <laughs> Um, so whereas Wizards of the Coast sells you their big expensive books, and now they're trying to move to only selling them on D&D Beyond, uh, the old school revival had all their third party clones and you could buy them for super cheap and print them out yourself. 
And then I start seeing this, this hashtag bro SR. I'm like, who the heck is the bro SR? They were posting a bunch of bodybuilder memes. And they were posting a bunch of uh, wrestler memes. And they seem to be laughing their heads off and having a great time. While also enraging half of D&D Twitter. Because they came out and they, they told them all, you are doing it wrong. That you have been playing D&D wrong. All right. So we're going to get into those guys in a bit. Because I've like, I've lost friends. And I've had to actually change my Twitter handle uh, because of what happened there. And we'll get into that. Um, but just 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 for later, just think uh, the Bro SR, they they don't buy third party clones or Wizards of the Coast. They try to find eBay original AD&D first edition books. Um, the other thing is, though, is um, let me grab this stuff. Drive through RPG did start offering print on demand. So you don't have to buy some some weird ripoff clone. You can buy the original. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition um, hardback. It takes a bit to get to your house, but you know, here's the Fiend folio from first edition. Uh, this was a British monster manual. Um, you can get your hands on this stuff. And so once Drive Through RPG started letting you buy the old back catalog, um, that addressed some of the issue that the OSR was there to fix. Um, Hashtag no prep. I'm going from having to memorize Curse of Strahd to just having a, you know, so I talked about the polished art on the conventional. The old school is about polished layout. Is everything on the page so that a DM with very little prep can run the adventure and get it right? Um, if you look at some of the, the OSR modules, they are very, um, in the, the art may not be the best and some of it will probably be public domain, but the way they lay it out is so easy to run at the table that you almost don't need to read it before you play. I recommend reading it before you play. But um, Louis says, I have two sets of all the AD&D first edition books. My original ones I bought in the late 70s, another set that was gifted to me at some point. They're in mint condition. Ah, choice. Do you have the orange spine or do you have the originals? Or one set of each? Um, right on, man. Um, so which way is best? Which way is best? Uh, that is, well, actually, before I move on, I do want to have somebody, and that may not be the only one talking. Um, some of you grown yards, uh, that's that's um, a term for people that have played D&D for a long time. It's from the French army and uh, the people that were so elite, they were allowed to grumble, the grumblers, the grown yards. Um, what would you say is the difference between a railroad and a sandbox campaign? Don, I see you with that red box. Moldvay basic. Anybody got an idea what's the difference between a railroad and a sandbox? Uh, William says railroad games are linear. Uh, the term railroad, I think, comes from video games uh, where there were certain levels of a first person shooter where you would be like, I think it was, um, was it Medal of Honor? where there's a you're on a you're on a train and you've got a gun and so you're fighting all the stuff that's coming at you you know with your gun you're shooting the bad guys where they can get you but you're not in control of where you go you're not driving a truck you know you're just on the rails and you're going to go where the adventure goes if there is a boss fight in Strahd's castle at the end of the adventure guess what's happening for those characters if they don't die first <laughs> right um Tristan says railroad has predefined plot points, whereas sandbox just has environmental elements for players to interact with. Right. And so like one of the jobs that makes the DM's job hard and what separates a good conventional DM from a bad one is how well do you hide the tracks? How well can you just lay out hooks and weave things together to where the players have the um perception of autonomy whereas they're really just moving along a predetermined path and the ones that are bad at it the players will write, figure them out quick and it'll probably end the campaign 
And the ones that are good at it, it'll take them a little longer to figure it out. Whereas a sandbox is, um, okay, like, so one of the, uh, one of, so Redbox, uh, one of the original modules that came with original Dungeons and Dragons uh, is called uh, B2, the Keep on the Borderlands. And that adventure, it doesn't have a climax. It doesn't have a, um, a, a plot. It's just got a keep. You know, it's like this gated castle with some, some dwellings in it. That's where the good guys are. And it's got a cave of chaos that's like in this valley. There's all these caves and each one has a different type of monster race living in it. And um, the bad guys are bad guys and the humans are good guys. You may get a dwarf or elf hanging around, but everyone kind of looks at them like, I'm eh, not sure about that one. I don't think they have souls, do you? Um, and then if it's like a goblin or a kobold, man, they, they're just straight evil. They're just fighting for chaos they want the clouds of chaos to cover the sun so the world will be in darkness and they can walk around however they want. And so old school alignment makes way more sense. Law is the forces of light and justice and order and chaos is the forces of we're blotting out your sun and we're going to kill all your people and take all your land. <laughs> um, man, I, I feel like I'm getting off on tangents. I am. There's so much to talk about with this stuff, right? So um, <clears throat> uh, Broisar is all about total player autonomy, no prep DM. They do not believe in using modules at all. Um, and yeah, the bodybuilding memes. Uh, the, the, the bro, I saw our part of it, the chads. <laughs> all right, so <coughs> which one's best? Before we can answer, let's, let's just kind of figure out how we got here. So it starts off in 1972, um, October 24 is the publication of the first D&D &D edition. And you'll hear this referred to as OD&D or the three LBBs, which are the three little brown books. And um, it starts, it even says it on the, uh, on the cover that it is a miniature war game. So it starts as a war game. Um, then we get the publication of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons by E. Gary Gygax. And what happened between the two? Well, the first Dungeons and Dragons said Gygax and Arneson, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax were the ones that created it. By the time we get to it, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition, Arneson's name is not on the cover. He has been kicked out of the company. It's a tragic thing and you'll see it gets repeated over and over, right? So, uh, Gary had the helm until uh, the second edition when it comes out. Gary has also exited the company, TSR. Um, <clears throat> these two guys created a game that set the world on fire, and they both got ejected from their companies. It's kind of disgraceful. Um, 1996 rolls around, and Wizards of the Coast purchases TSR. Wizards of the Coast, fat, riding high on their magic, the gathering money. They came up with a customizable card game that sold just crazy. And they bought uh, the Dun they brought TSR, and they released the third edition and then 3.5, which a lot of people um, really love. Third and third 3.5 because it is like the crunchiest D and D. And what do I mean by crunch? Um, somebody put it in the chat if you know what I mean when I say crunchy. What is a crunchy game system? I'm sick, y'all. Don't make me do all the talking. I'll get I'll get Luis back on here, and he'll just he and I just cough up fur balls. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe maybe y'all don't know. A uh, crunchy game system has a lot of rules and a lot of math. Yeah, William says in a word, complex. And so, um, <clears throat> Wizards of the Coast. Seems like sooner or later everyone always thinks, well, man, video games are selling so well. We need to we need to emulate that. And so they make the infamous decision to release fourth edition. And it is so uh poorly received that 3.5 spawns off into a whole other game. Um, a company called Paizo took a bunch of the employees from TSR, they took the ideas and they created a game called Pathfinder. Right? math rocks go burr yeah so pathfinder and pathfinder is still crushing it like that was such a big mistake 
Um, but Pathfinder released under the OGL, the open gaming license, where you're allowed to make adjacent materials, right? And they won't sue you. Um, well, they took, they, they, Pathfinder is the second biggest role playing game company right now. And it's because of this. And as I said, fourth edition just went over like a lead balloon. Everyone was upset with it. And fifth edition was them trying to get back on track. I cannot re recommend this movie enough. If you haven't seen it, <clears throat> it's called Secrets of Blackmore. And it is a documentary that they made in 2019, 2018, where they went and they interviewed the original people that made the jump from what they were, like the ones that created this hobby. It happened in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And they were a bunch of war gamers um, they were playing Napoleonics. They'd go down in Dave Arneson's basement. He had uh, a couple of ping pong tables and they would put terrain up and they would have all the little horse soldiers, pike and shot Napoleonics. And they would do these wars and they just had a blast with it. He wanted to play with more people. He went to the library and he found a book from the 1800s called Strategos, which was used to train American soldiers. And he decided, oh, I'm going to look and see who else has checked out this book. And he got a list of names and he called them all and said, hey, you guys want to play war games with me? And that's how he found that first group. And uh, part of them, part of the group was a, a guy named David Wesley. And he would go on to join the military. Uh, but he decided to do something a little different one night. He told everybody that showed up, all right, we're going to have a war game tomorrow. But tonight we're going to set it up. And it's going to take place in, a, in the city of Bronstein in um in prussia and it's it was so called because there was a river there with rocks and the rocks were stained brown from the river so brownstone bronstein <clears throat> and what he did was he had generals and he had um it, there was a college there and so he had like the dean of students and that kind of stuff and he gave everybody a role and it was laid out on the table and he sent them into another room and they got to come in one by one and tell him what their person was going to do. And what they thought they were doing was setting up resources and field position and alliances for the game that was going to happen the next day. But the secret was there was no game the next day. Like this was the game was taking on these, these personalities and seeing what you could get out of it. And the game quickly got out of his control. Uh, because people were in the other room, they started making deals with each other they each had different goals. They were, some of them were working to screw each other over. Some of them were working to help together. And he felt like he lost control and it was a disaster. And they were like, this is one of the most fun things we've ever done. And the concept of I'm showing up to play a war game and I'm in charge of an army narrowed down to I'm showing up to play a war game and I'm in charge of one person. And that was kind of the the catalyst for what would become tabletop role-playing games where you play a war game, but you're not in charge of an army. You're in charge of one person. Um, so they, they did a couple more of those. So all of that comes out in this movie and you'll realize that, you know, Gygax gets a lot of credit, but Arneson really came up with it. Gygax was better at publishing and writing and stuff. Um, but Arneson was the secret sauce in bringing what we have uh, to life. So, um, I recommend you guys go see that. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, you can rent it or you can buy it. I knew I was going to watch it multiple times, so I just bought it. And it wasn't that much more expensive to buy than to rent. But if you're interested in where did this hobby come from, this movie is phenomenal. And I interviewed the guy that made the movie on my um, YouTube channel, if you're interested in that as well. <clears throat> so, but let's let's jump to the present. Uh, how did how did we get to where D and D is so in the cultural zeitgeist that we're going to have a whole TLDC weekend about it, right? Well, a few things happened. Uh, number one, there was a TV show came out called Stranger Things. I don't know, you guys ever heard of it? Uh, one of my favorites ever. I was I was born in 1977. This movie hit the resonance for a kid that grew up in the 80s. Um, it wasn't a movie. It's a TV series. Uh, it's, it's a Netflix series, uh, Stranger Things. But one of the things that happens is that the kids in this series are playing Dungeons and Dragons and having a great time. So, boom, 
that hits in the cultural zeitgeist. The second thing that happened is, um, have you ever heard of a show called Critical Role? CR. Um, <clears throat> let me just tell you how crazy this is, this story. Um, Critical Role, everybody that you see in the bottom left corner of the screen, they are all uh, voice actors, right? So they work in Hollywood, but they're not in front of the camera. They go in a booth and they voice all the characters in, in cartoons and anime and that kind of stuff. And they're phenomenal at it. Like not just can they do silly voices, but like they can put emotion and singing and all kinds of stuff into it. So um, they they got a dude there named Matt Mercer who loves playing D&D. I think actually they were playing Pathfinder to start and they had a home game. You know, they'd go out, they'd do their gigs and they'd come back and they'd all go over to Matt's house and they'd play Dungeons and Dragons together and they'd have such a good time. Well, um, I think it was, um, oh, what's Will Wheaton's uh, something and sun, geek and sundry. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Geek and Sundry Entertainment Company said, hey, you guys, uh, I think one of them got invited. Like, Was it Felicia Day, uh, Ren? You guys know more than I. Uh, I'm not a Critical Role fan. I'm here to make you angry. Remember that. Um, they uh, came over and saw them playing and saw these guys are so extra. Like, you want to talk about... Um, the DM sets up a scene and then he can just sit back and watch two actors totally act it out in person and like embody and invoice their characters. <clears throat> Sets kind of a high, high standard, right? Maybe that's playing into why fifth edition has a DM problem because uh, very few people can be Matt Mercer and very few people can sit across a table full of professional voice actors, um, improv artists. But um, anyway, that aside, this show came out on Twitch, which if you haven't watched it, Twitch is a platform for mainly for video gamers to, to stream themselves playing video games and get money for doing so. I know, what kind of a world have we inherited? But that's a thing. You can play a video game and you can get paid by people that are not as good at it as you are that want to watch you. And this tabletop role-playing game crushed every other channel it became the number one channel on twitch and it has made them the most money out of everything a tabletop role-playing game so you've got stranger things you've got critical role both just kind of blowing up right at the time when fifth edition has come out and then you see the center of my screen the covid the uh the the covid virus it's a horrible, horrible thing. We should have never invented it. But one of the things that it did was it locked everybody in their homes. So if you were used to playing Battletech, can't play that if you're not going over to someone's house. Can't play Warhammer 40,000. Can't play, um, what's the bird game? Wingspan. But you can jump on a Zoom like I'm doing right now. You can... You can get your crazy math rocks, your weird shaped dice, and you guys can have an adventure regardless of where you are in the country or the world. And fifth edition just took off, which is why I have the lich just going blah, ha, 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 because it was the perfect storm. You had mainstream media, you had gamer media, you had a worldwide crisis, and they just shot up through the ranks. Let me see. Let me make sure I'm keeping up with the chat here. Uh, Don agrees with me about uh, Critical Role. It was the hardest thing. It raised the expectations of so many players that this is how games are all the time. I mean, it was a good thing, too, in that people that don't know how Dungeons & Dragons are played, you could say, hey, go watch this video, and you'll see how it goes. But the, the other side of that is people that showed up for the very first time were going to expect a, a filmable event, and real D&D just don't go like that. Not the real stuff. Did I just say that Matt Mercer doesn't play real D and D? Yes, I did. I think I did. <clears throat> uh, Nicholas says many players who come to my table have watched Critical Role and feel intimidated. Yeah, you can let them off a the hook. You can tell them Critical Role doesn't play real D and D. Oh man, I'm gonna get so much crap for this. All right, 
So what is the alternative? If uh, if if fifth edition, if if putting the story first and the railroad is conventional play, and remember, I am going to try my best to tie it back to uh, e-learning. You know, we do. I do still have Gagne in the title. <laughs> um, here's what I found when I started watching what the Broasar was doing. There's a man on Twitter named Jeffro Johnson. People hate this man. Because, well, it, he, he actually, it actually started with him getting bullied. Uh, there was another guy on Twitter named Mephrodis. And Mephrodis bullied Jeffro into playing Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. And Jeffro was like, I can't be done. It's, it's, it is like the Mount Rushmore. Not Mount Rushmore. Uh, what's the big mountain? Come on, brain. What's the, uh, this is the cough syrup thinking here. What's the, the uh, Mount Everest? Thank you, thank you, Kim Lindsay. <clears throat> um, Don, I I totally get it that you can disagree. Oh, you're disagreeing with Tristan? Or are you disagreeing with me? Uh, Tristan says Critical Role is great. Dropout, former college humor, also has live play shows called Dimension Twenty, which are fantastic. Uh, Don says I disagree. I think he plays D and D. Oh, she is disagreeing with me. I think he plays D&D, but they are actors and aware of their audience and fan base, artists, book deals, etc. They know what people want and how to pass the spotlight. See the fact that there is a spotlight. Um, you can disagree with me, Dom, but you're wrong about that. I'm sorry. Um, Mount Everest is first edition. And he was like, can't be done. And Mephrodis is like, he just bullied him and said, do it. So Jeff Rowe took first edition and he decided, you know what? I am going to treat this as if Gary has just handed it to me and said, can you play test this? You're going to see why I say that, Don, in a minute. Um, <laughs> she's probably like so mad at me right now. Um, <clears throat> can you play this? Right. Remember, this first edition was the last one that Gary had his fingerprints on. After this, he gets kicked out, and uh, corporate America creates your DD from that point on. Right. So, <clears throat> um, Jeffro said, well, I, the first principle that I'm going to use is rules as written. Oops, I need to go back. Um, you'll see R-A-W. Why are, why are rules as written so important? Put in the chat if you want. Because there are people that play the other way, too. They say, I'm going to do rule zero. Or I'm going to do rule of cool. Or I'm going to fudge the dice, right? I'm going to roll the dice behind my screen. And even if the monster would have killed them, because I like my players and I like my characters, I'm going to fudge it a little bit, right? Um, no. Uh, he said, I'm going to do this heartlessly. I'm going to do it rules as written. <clears throat> and when he committed to that, he found out that there were a bunch of rules in the original game that were weird and awkward and hard and as a collective gamer society, we just let go of them. We did not adopt them. Or the ones that did, didn't share with the rest of us. So you got Gen Xers like me coming up after all the good stuff's gone. You know, second edition is when I started paying attention. You know, I got my comic books and I see Ravenloft in the back of the, uh, the you know, ads in the back. <clears throat> um so what are some of these rules I'm talking about that, that the Broasar claims to be rediscovering? Well, one of them is one-to-one -one time. Anybody heard of this concept? Don has. Um, of course, Don has. <laughs> so um, it, it's often misunderstood. Uh, what one-to-one -one time means is that when a session is done at the table, when you get up from that session, that the time will move forward at the same rate as the calendar. So one day in our real time equals one day in the game time. And you may say, well, of course, of course we let go of that rule. That sounds like a lot of extra work. Why do you, why do you want to keep track of that, right? Why do you want to keep track of what day it is in the game when you're not playing the game? Oh, my friends, that is because you are always playing this game. It is an always on game. <clears throat> so what does this mean? Let, let me show you an example. So a session will go normal. 
meaning you can take up way more than one day's worth of time. Or like, let's say you got a three hour session. One to one time doesn't mean that everything your character does, they have to accomplish in three hours. So you may say, okay, um, I got my party. You know, there's three guys playing tonight. They've all got a character and their job is to, they've, they've figured out that there is an orc stronghold um, four days ride out of town. So they gather their supplies and they're going to go raid that dungeon. And so you're sitting there playing and you say, okay, so um, we'll do four days. And the, and the dungeon master will roll for random encounters. Whenever you're traveling overland, there's a chance you're going to hit a monster or something. Uh, but let's say there's no encounters. They get there. Then they play the session where they clear out the first couple of levels of the dungeon. And then... Um, Oh, shoot. What do we do? We're only halfway through the second level of the dungeon, and it's 1130, and we got to go, man. We got to work tomorrow. Uh, what do you do at this moment? Well, in conventional gameplay, you would say, oh, no problem. We'll just pause. Pause time. And if everybody can make it next week, we'll just pick up where we left off, and you'll keep, you know, rocking the dungeon, right? If you're committed to one-to-one -one time, nope, you don't dare leave your party in the dungeon. Why? Well, uh, in the dungeon, every hour, you're rolling 1d6 to see if they have a random monster encounter. Because it's not just like, it's not like just a dungeon where everything stands in a T-pose and waits for you to get into the room and then activates like a video game. No, they're doing stuff. They The, the creatures in the dungeon got to go to the bathroom. They got to get water. They got to cook food. They're going to go on hunting parties. They're doing their stuff. They're living their lives. And you just decided to go T-pose in their home. What do you think is going to happen to you? If you can't play again for a week, guess how many hours are in a week? You got a one in six chance each time they roll the dice of something. Your guys will die. Even if, even if you could somehow play outside of the game, they would run out of resources. They'd run out of arrows and water and they would die. So the idea is 11 o'clock comes, you start looking around like, okay, guys, uh, I'm going to got to get ready to go. So everybody gathers up whatever loot they've gotten and they haul it out of the dungeon and come back to town. You may think, well, that's, that's kind of weird. Cause maybe my characters wouldn't do that because you know, it's, it's 11 here, but it's only midday there. Um, but guess what? It's not a bug. It's a feature. Remember the problem I was having where not everybody could come next week. <clears throat> Well, in this style of play, it doesn't matter because everyone made it back to safety, made it back to town, and whoever's there to play next week, then we roll on another sortie. And you don't even have to worry about it because nobody in their right mind will end in a dungeon. Right? There's other rules that have been lost over time that were load-bearing, that we didn't understand them and we didn't get them, and when we removed them, it changed the game. For example, in 5th edition right now, I believe the only way to get experience to level up is to either kill stuff or be rewarded for superior role play or solving puzzles or figuring things out. Um, or if the DM has is using the milestone system where they just, it's kind of like mother may I, where you don't get to level up until the DM says, okay, enough things have happened that now I'm going to let you go to level two. <clears throat> so... How did it work back then in the day in first edition? Well, only half of your XP came from things that you killed. The other half, each gold piece that you brought back to society was one XP for you. So one GP equals one XP. So you say, well, why would people go into a dungeon? It's dark, it's smelly, it's scary, it's deadly. Well, if half of your experience or more is coming from the treasure that you're hauling out of the dungeon, that's a pretty good reason to risk it, right? Um, in one to one time at the beginning of every month, you got to pay your expenses. If you've got rent, you know, your food, that kind of stuff, you do not want to run out of, out of money in a one to one time game. <clears throat> other interesting things show up. I don't want to get too far into this because I got other stuff to talk about, but, um, in one to one time, let's say those guys four days out, they spent a day raiding and they came four days back, Right. So that's nine days. But the next time we play, it's only been seven days in the real world. Well, I can't play those characters because I already know what they're doing. We've decided what they're doing for those nine days. They're either in the dungeon or they're on their way back. Right. Um, 
So now it's time, if I want to play tonight, I got to roll up a new character. So I have, I have multiple characters per player. And now get this. Let's say my new character is back in town and I get a quest hook and they say, oh, the wizard needs some help. And <clears throat> you say, okay, I'll, I'll go. And you go to the wizard and the wizard says, hey, I just heard that my friend, the, uh, the orc chieftain, that somebody hit his dungeon. And I want, I'm paying a thousand gold pieces if you'll go to the goblin town and hire a band of goblins to attack that party on their way back and take their loot. What do you do now? <laughs> because your character that you're playing over here doesn't know that the, pe the people that raided that dungeon are your other characters, right? Like, you know, as a player, but if you're role playing, um, oops, if you're role playing, then you're like, yeah, I'm going to screw that guy to get the thousand gold pieces. And then now you've created an interesting scenario for the next time you can play those other players, right? Um, it can set up weird. I have, I have played in a game where one player was playing a different character and his other character showed up and as his other character ran out of the dungeon he jumped out of hiding and backstabbed and killed he had one of his characters kill the other character it was amazing who has stories like that well people that play this way do um downtime activities now gygax he had a phone and people could come over but We've got Discord and Twitter and IMs and um, texting. And so a DM, when your player is on their downtime, you can say, what's the boring stuff that nobody likes role playing when you're actually in a session? Shopping? Like there's famous critical role episodes where one guy's buying a bunch of stuff and everyone's rolling their eyes because it's so boring and he's making it about himself. Well, in this style of play, you just text the DM, okay, this week back in town, I spend my 400 silver that I picked up on a new helmet. And he's like, okay, next time you play, you're ready to go. You don't have to role play, shopkeeper talk, any of that stuff. You're just good to go. Um, <clears throat> mass combat. Old school rules. Uh, you know, the wizards get really powerful on an exponential level, but the fighter progression is linear, except the fighter has the ability to recruit hirelings and men at arms and to train them. So the idea is as the wizard's getting more spells, the fighter is hiring more and more men. And so you're rolling with armies. And it's not just the fighter that can do that. He has the best time of it. Wizards, thieves, anybody can do this. Thieves can start a thieves guild. You don't just spend your whole career grubbing for gold pieces in a dungeon. At some point, you level up and you get to build a stronghold and you start playing the domain game. It's like, and um, this was another thing on Twitter where people were, were arguing about the style of play and they were like, oh, no, that's not realistic. I don't want to be in charge of a whole army. And someone dropped a sick burn and said, oh, yeah, you're you're mad that the end of The Hobbit was the, wasn't the Battle of the Five Dudes instead of the Battle of the Five Armies, right? Um, mass combat can happen in this. And I've also been in sessions where it is just hundreds of people on a side. You know, like we, we, we hit an orc baggage train after a war and it was it was just crazy and it was fun and it was exciting. And uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm geeking out too much, even just telling you guys about this stuff. Um, Bronstein and patron play. There was a guy, this guy was actually playing fifth edition. His name is Chanticleer and he was playing. Um, hey, Luis, are, do we have a hard cut off at six or can we go over? Because I might not get to all the all the spicy takes. Yeah, Kim says, did Kanye play? <laughs> um, no, you, you can keep going. I don't. People don't have to hang out, right? You know. Yeah, so yeah. If you I'm need, in, you know, need to go, I'll, I'll just keep crazy. going. So just keep going. Just keep going. And and all you right. know, I totally understand. Because yeah, anyway, as long as your voice holds up, mine is not. But um, okay. yeah, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Don't make me laugh. Start coughing. <laughs> All right. Um, so Bronstein, right? Remember that first one that led to D&D? &D? Uh, this guy, Chanticleer, he was playing a fifth edition module called uh, uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. And I don't know if anybody's played that one, but basically it takes place in a city and there's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of mob bosses, right? All right. I'll see you, Kim. I'll see you, Tom. It was so fun being with you guys. Hopefully I didn't enrage you too badly. <laughs>
by telling you you're playing wrong. Ah. Um, I'm really looking forward to your session too, Tom. Uh, this guy knows what he's talking about with D&D. &D. <laughs> Never speaking to you again. <laughs> Uh, Peter's got a hard cut off at midnight. Okay. Uh, where was I? Oh, patron play. So he decided, you know what? It's too much for me to keep in my brain all of these mob bosses, right? Like you've got Xanathar. He's like one of those uh, eyeball creatures, the beholders. Um, he's running part of the town. You've got some crime families. you got like a ton of different um, factions is what we'll call them. Powerful NPCs. And what Chanticleer did was, he's like, you know what? I'm sick of trying to keep all this in my head while I'm DMing. And he just asked a few of his buddies if they would be willing to take on the role of that powerful NPC. He was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you who you are. I'm going to give you what your resources are. And then you just figure out what that guy wants to do and tell me what he does. Right? So now it's not on his, he's just, he's adjudicating the game. Right? Right? Conventional D and D, the DM is a storyteller, and they are bringing you through the story. This style, the DM is an impartial referee that's just there to tell you how the world physically responds to the actions you take in it. And he doesn't have a dog in the fight. He's just saying, how would the things that are there realistically respond to what you're putting into the world? And what he found when the patrons got rolling was that they were generating hooks he never would have thought of. And I actually tried this. I was playing with my um, in-person, so we don't play very often, the bunch of dads that I get to play with in person. And I was doing Keep on the Borderlands. And so they had they'd gone to the keep. They'd gotten the help of this priest that lives in the keep. They'd gone to the... Um, the first cave where the kobolds were. Kobolds are little, um, think of like, they're small like goblins, but they're like little dragon lizard dog people. They're little drag dogs. Anyway, <clears throat> we get in there and it was a complete disaster. They didn't buy any torches. They're used to playing fifth edition where everything has dark sight. So when you play real D and D, oh crap. Now we gotta, we gotta take care of our, we gotta mind our resources and nobody bought any torches. Um, so the clerics cast light on their maces and they walked in. Well, actually, I'm sorry, only one. It was the priest, that, the NPC priest, cast light on his mace. They went in there. They had a fight with the kobolds. In the middle of the fight, the light went out and uh, one of them got knocked on the head and the wizard just ran for it. And so at the end of the session, one of the player characters had been captured by the kobolds, was just down in a pit. The other players were on the road home, you know, bloodied. They didn't get any money. They got, you know, their weapons taken from them. It was a pretty rough session for them. And I decided I'm going to test this out. So I had some other buddies and I, uh, but my buddy Dave in charge of the kobolds. I said, you are the chief of the kobolds. Here's how many live in your tunnel. Here's some of the politics going on. And I told my buddy, Andy, you are the, the priest that spoiler alert. The, uh, the priest is the one that betrayed them. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have read the module or not. I think the uh, statute of limitations is run out on keep on the borderlands as far as spoilers go. But anyway, the priest cannot be trusted, even though he seems like a good guy. So I said, all right, Andy, you're in charge of the priest. I said, Dave, you're in charge of the kobolds. And I said, here's your, here's your deal, Dave. You know, just texting him. Um, you've captured the cleric from the party. You can feed him to your kobolds. You can eat them because they're bad guys. They eat people. Um, you can hold them for ransom. And try to get some money out of him, you know, say, all right, well, the players have to get together 10,000 gold pieces to get him back, right? And he goes, I'm going to hold him for ransom. I was like, okay, what do you want? And he says, well, the goblins on the other side of the valley have an ogre. And the kobolds want their own. We want an ogre. And my jaw just dropped. Because I never would have thought of that. I never would have thought of that. <clears throat> and so, and that, that is so cruel, right? To drop that on the players. Like they just got their butts kicked. They lost a member and now they get a message. They sent one of the one of the fighting men back, no armor or anything. He just had a sign around his neck that said, we'll trade cleric for ogre. And now they're like, how the heck are we going to get an ogre? And like they start having to do research and figure out where the ogres are and that kind of thing and hatch these other plans. And just by letting someone else run one of the players, it blew my mind how it changed the game. And I am not that cruel. I would have come up with something easier. 
But Dave doesn't care about the players. He just wants to do well as a cobalt chieftain. And so he's going to make decisions that would never occur to somebody who's trying to run everything. He's just going to make decisions as the cobalt chief. And uh, meanwhile, my buddy Andy has this whole plot where he's going to try and poison the town water. He's been hoarding water, so he's going to poison the water and then they'll have to come to him for it. Right. Like nobody else had that happen when they played keep on the borderlands. I guarantee it. <clears throat> so um, that's why I'm really on fire for this style of play. And that's why when my boys get on Twitter and tell other people that they're doing D&D &D wrong, that they're not playing real D&D, &D, I should cringe at that. But I laugh my head off. Um, I'm not as hardcore as they are. You know, obviously, if you're having fun playing the game, do whatever you like. I'm not here to. I'm not here. They're, they're there to kick the door in and, and be a bully. Um, I'm just glad people are playing and having fun. But I found that my game has been enhanced as I've taken on some of these ideas that are not brand new, that were there from the beginning. We just forgot them. So the next thing that I have is cross-world events. So this is what happened. I have the link down there for uh, Jeff Rose Space Gaming blog. Uh, he started the world of Trilopolis. Trilopolis was the first uh, bro SR campaign. <clears throat> uh, it's not, it has nothing to do with trolls. <laughs> Infamously in the back of the dungeon master's guide, there is a harlot table. So if you're in a city, you can roll up all the different things that you might come across in the city. Um, and uh, one of them is what kind of trollops you may meet in the big city. So that's why Trilopolis is called Trilopolis. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> he has, he, Jeff Rowe has also written a book called Appendix N, which we'll get to in a minute, but he's read a bunch of these fantasy and sci-fi books that were written before 1980, which really played into what Gary and Dave created with Dungeons and Dragons. There's a whole part of the culture that we have moved on and we don't really understand the game until we, we read these. Like, for example, I didn't understand uh, player alignment in D, D until i read a book by paul anderson called three hearts three lions and then i got it and i was like oh that's where that came from that they took that right from that book that's also where they got the paladin class from heartily recommend the book it's an amazing read so i'm gonna take a, a throat lozenge here because i'm starting to get a little rough um so he had his characters interacting and they wanted to talk to the mayor and he was like oh crap i need a mayor and so he just grabbed a character called Elric of Melnibene from Michael Moorcock's uh, longstanding fantasy series. <clears throat> so when, um, well, let me, let me click on the link and show you. I'll drag the blog over here. So this is the secret history of Trilopolis. This is the session where Jeff Rowe turned on all of his patrons at once. And you got a guy in there named Macho Mandolf, right? <laughs> picture picture Gandalf and Macho Randy the Macho Man Savage. And he fought uh, a, a, a witch who came, or not a witch, a, a powerful magic user who came pretty much out of the movie She, right? Or the book. Um, so you've got all these like memes and stuff going on. <clears throat> um. Well, it, it came that the people that got invited to play as patrons started getting on Twitter and just memeing. Like one guy was in charge of the cavemen. All he had was the monster manual info for cavemen. And so that he was the caveman delegation. He started posting all these grug memes to Twitter. And it was hilarious. And everybody wanted to take part. So the guy playing Elric of Melnibene goes to visit the caveman federation but because of wilderness rules, he got lost along the way and he came to the wrong cavemen. And while he was trying to talk to them and they didn't understand him, there was another player who was a guy playing, a, a, his character was called Fluid the Druid. And um, Fluid cast a lightning bolt and hit, from hiding, hit Elric of Melnibene right as he put his sword down. He drew his sword and put it down to show the, the cavemen that he didn't mean any harm. Well, Fluid struck him with lightning and then the cave people freaked out and ran and beat him to death with clubs. So this powerful NPC just gets killed. And then Fluid grabs his sword and brings it back. And 
if you've read those books, the sword is is a big deal. It's called Stormbringer. And it's actually a demigod is trapped inside of it. And whatever it hits, it will suck the soul out of. So you think, oh, that's kind of silly. <clears throat> well, down the road, that sword has caused so many problems that one of the characters decides that he wants to get rid of it out of Trilopolis and send it into another campaign. There's a guy named B-Dubs. He started off playing in Trilopolis and he said, you know what? I can do this better. And he started his own bro SR campaign um, called Dubs Our Own. And they said, let's dump the sword in Dubs Our Own. We're sick of it. So here's the thing. Trilopolis and Dubs Our Own are both using one-to-one -one time. So they know what day that happened in both campaigns. And then once the sword showed up, all the players in Dubs Our Own wanted to get it. And there was a big war. One of the players happened to be a spaceman. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> he flew his spaceship down, scoops up the sword, and he's like, I'll solve this right now, and I'll throw it into the sun. And everyone thinks, okay, well, that's over, right? Until one player raises their hand and says, um, in Dubzeron, the sun is actually a god as well named Aminar. What happens if a sword that can suck your soul out hits a god's son? And they were like, oh. I don't know. Let's figure it out. So the guy that <clears throat> was playing the spaceman actually was a NASA guy. He was an astrophysicist, and he calculated from where he let go of the sword how long the orbital decay would take for the sword to hit the sun. So everybody knew, I can't remember, I think it was like September 14 in the real world. Everyone knew September 14, that, so that sword's going to hit the sun. And if it goes in, it's going to it's going to it may not kill the god but it will severely weaken him for a long time right but again it's not just a ball of gas it's a god and so he's going to try to defend himself so he's going to call for aid and get all of his forces to try to intercept the sword and all of the bad guy players were like well we're going to call all of our forces to try and surround the sword and make sure it goes in so they had this huge cosmic war game going and they got a friend of theirs named um, John Mollison. Uh, he has a YouTube channel called Mr. Wargaming. It's called The Joy of Wargaming. And he, they came to him and they said, here's how out of hand this thing has gotten. There's like four different campaigns that are depending on this. If that sword hits the sun, evil is going to get a bonus in all of them. And good is going to um, good is gonna get nerfed. <clears throat> but if the good guys win, they can get the sword and they can put it in another dimension where it'll be safe. So they came to him and they said, you're a wargaming channel. Can you play this out? And so he did one day each turn. You know, all of the all of the good characters in all of their campaigns, like the clerics were like, okay, if we sacrifice this much money and we pray for this many weeks, then he will let us get, you know, field four star giants today. And if we keep doing it, you know, for the more that we sacrifice and pray, the more forces the good guys get. And um, he so he just he recorded the battle and but just posted each each night what happened that day um, until the end. And so, I mean, I'm not trying to get too far into it, but with one to one time, you can have like DC versus Marvel kind of crossover events where you can have stuff that impacts everyone. And it's just crazy. And it has transformed the game. And this is what we used to have. And we don't anymore because we let go of all those old icky boring who cares about them rules all right so that's the cross world event appendix a <clears throat> if you if you look in the first edition dungeon master's guide and by the way this is also in the fifth edition dungeon master's guide you have these appendices actually why am i doing it why am i doing it analog i think i have I think I have it up here. All right. So here's Appendix A. You can roll up. These are like random starting areas. You can roll up a random dungeon. And as your players are going through it and investigating it, you can roll and see, okay, what's up next? Is it a hallway? Does it continue straight? Is there a door? Is there a side passage? What kind of side passage if it is? How many turns are there? Is there a special passage? Is there a hidden one? Uh, chambers, rooms, and shape and size. How big is it? What shape is it? This thing, you can auto-generate a dungeon as your players go through it. 
So you talk about no prep. I didn't have to remember a whole uh, module that I bought. I didn't even have to plan what they were going to do tonight. I just show up and say, what are you going to do? And if I've put the work in and I've got hashtag book control and I know what table to use when, I can play a dungeon that creates itself as they play and populates itself with treasure and monster and traps and all of that. Also, uh, Appendix uh, Appendix C is um, monster encounters. There's an overland one uh, for like for a hex crawl, for uh, what hex are you in? Um, <clears throat> okay, let's get past the monsters. I don't know if you guys saw that naughty one. There was a naughty one. I had to go past it. Um, you got a castle subtable. What kind of castle are we going to come across out here? Um, Subarctic conditions. There is so much in the appendices that Gary built that you can... Now, you don't have to run it that way. You don't have to run no prep. But if the players turn left when you thought they were going to turn right, all you need is your dice. And you could say, all right, let's see what is down there. And as a DM, you get to be surprised when they are. How often does the DM get surprised? How often does the DM say, whoa, I can't believe, I can't believe that was down there? Right? Um, creatures from the lower planes. Let me get to it. The next appendix I want to talk about, and I've already kind of brought it up a little bit, is Appendix N. Oh, still on traps. Still on traps and tricks. There's so much in this book. This book is a treasure trove. Here we go. Appendix N, Inspirational and Educational Reading. Now, a lot of people think that Gary and Dave based this on Lord of the Rings, and that was it. And Lord of the Rings is on the list. Here's J.R.R. Tolkien, The Hobbit, and the Ring Trilogy. Oops. But see how far down the list it is? Starts off with Paul Anderson's Three Hearts, Three Lions, The High Crusade, The Broken Sword, John Belair's Face in the Frost, Lee Brackett, Frederick Brown, Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, Conan is in here. John Carter of Mars is in here. Princess of Mars. Fofford and the Gray Mauser. A. Merritt. Creep Shadow Creep. So these are the books that all the pieces and parts in their subconscious just fed into creating this game. And so that's one of the claims that um, Jeffro Johnson has made. Oops. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um Let me catch up with myself. I shouldn't be using the scroll wheel. Um, I have it around here somewhere. It's called Appendix N. And basically, he did a write-up on several of the major works in Appendix N and what their impact on Dungeons & Dragons were. So I recommend that book. Um, <clears throat> and I do feel like it gets you in the mindset of a culture that's moved on to understand what were the sources of this stuff. Doesn't mean you need to stay there. You can take what you learn and bring it back to fifth edition if that's your favorite edition. Um, crap, I'm starting to be nice. What am I doing? I'm, uh, I'm here to make people upset with me. All right. So um, here's where Gary goes on about time. And notice all caps. You cannot have a meaningful campaign if strict time records are not kept. Um, here's the inspirational reading. I think I kind of took some of the so let's bring it all back, right? <coughs> Being such a nerd about the D&D. &D, thinking about um, railroad versus sandbox versus total player autonomy. How do we take the things that are good about this hobby that we love and use it to improve the kind of training that we do? So the, this is Gagne. Um, the nine events of learning, what parallels, put them in the chat, do you see between the nine events of learning and what player characters in a D&D &D campaign go through? William, uh, I want to get to your comment. You said, um, well, Peter said, I can imagine adding these sorts of tables to storyline to automate game elements. And he said, use waiting to ensure that key points are always included. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> the very first section in the uh, 
first edition, first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. What does Gary start us off with? But I don't know if you can see the dice there. And he's got dice curves where he tells you, okay, if you do a D20, that's a linear curve. If you, if you do 2D6, that's a bell curve. So if you're making these random charts and tables, <clears throat> the things towards the middle are going to come up way more often. And the things that are one or, the, you know, the two and the 12 are going to be the rarest ones to hit. So you, so as you build these random charts, you're also kind of telling people something about the world, right? Because what's more common here and what's more rare? Um, so let me catch up here. Peter says, uh, merely presenting in the form of a game should take care of number one. Yeah, gaining attention. I think of gaining attention as kind of like the character's hooks. Like the first moment the DM says, what do you want to do? And they say, let's go to the tavern and do some rumor mongering. Let's hear what's going on. If there's any, if there's anybody offering money for stuff, you know, you find out that there is an abandoned mine and we didn't get our last shipment of goods from the merchants that have to travel past it on the way. <coughs> So-and-so is offering a reward if you can find out what happened to that shipment. Maybe we should go check out that mine and see if something's moved in there and is preying on our trade routes, right? <coughs> Sorry. Man, I've even got a cough drop in. <clears throat> Don Metcalf says, grab their attention with a meaningful emotional hook. Inform people via their stats check to parcel out information that can be seeded to the players from one another. Use sensory details to make a realistic GM's NPCs provide guidance. I can tell you've done this a fair bit, Don. I can tell you're good at this kind of stuff. <clears throat> Although I will say, the guys that I play with in the Bro SR, like if you try to give them a backstory for your character, uh, they'll tell you that you have to do one push-up per word of backstory you give them. <laughs> Most of them, if you ask them for a backstory, they'll be like, oh, I'm a human fighter. <laughs> <coughs> A Wendy says, assessing performance, coming in after each and every action. <clears throat> that's another thing that's in old D&D that I don't know if it's in 5th. So in 5th edition, when it's time to level up, do you just get your level? Is it like a video game where you get like the gold sparkle rings around you and all of a sudden you're at level 2 and you get your bonuses and stuff? Because that's not how it is in Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition, <clears throat> when you get enough experience to level, you have to go back to town and you've got to find a mentor to train you. And you have to pay 1,500 gold pieces per level to level up. Right? So treasure is important. Gold is important. Encumbrance is important. How much can you carry out of the dungeon and still run fast enough to live? <clears throat> you can get to a point where you have enough experience to level up, but you don't have enough money to train for it, right? And in a one-to-one -one time game, let's say you have the money and the experience to train. If you performed your task the best, your game master will, will um, provide feedback in the form of telling you whether you were superior, excellent, average, or you didn't measure up. And depending on your average grade over the assignments you went on or the adventures you went on, <clears throat> if you got the highest, then you only have to train for one week and then you can get to the next level. If you got next highest, that's two weeks of training. That's 3,000 gold pieces and two weeks that you're gone before you can do another adventure. And if you did poor, like let's say that your job was a wizard and you didn't cast any of your spells and you tried to fight on the front line, you might have to do four weeks of training before you can level up. So that's what, 6,500 gold pieces. And <clears throat> you can't play that character again for a month because the character's in training jail. So that's the way, that's the old school way of assessing performance and providing feedback is, hey man, you were a thief and you didn't check for traps. You didn't pick any locks. You didn't do anything to keep your people alive in the dungeon. <clears throat> you're you're not going to get graded well. The DM is grading you as you play on how well you do. 
if you're a fighter and you don't charge the front and you don't protect the weaker guys behind you, sorry, your score's coming down. Don says, uh, 5e, you just level. Unless you want to expand a skill that you work on or as an artificer. And I hate that. And if you sleep, all of your points heal. What's up with that? Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, first edition, you heal one hit point per day. Unless you get some kind of magical healing. <clears throat> so you take you take you go out there and you take a whooping. Or even if you drop to unconsciousness and you don't like, let's say you drop to unconsciousness and somebody immediately heals you, you can get up and stumble away, but you are still gonna need bed rest for a week in first edition. It was brutal. I'd say fifth edition is is much more of like a superhero simulator because even at first level, you're very powerful. If you drop to zero hit points, you got three chances to recover, right? Well, two out of three chance, uh, three out of six. I don't know. <clears throat> uh, yeah, you're on the brink of death, and then take a nap, and that's fine. Yeah, it's it's a power nap, right? Um, <clears throat> stimulating recall of prior knowledge. Uh, this is for me. This is like the lore part where the older players tell the younger ones, "Oh, the last time we faced one of these, this is what happened. You better be careful, right?" Presenting information. That is the game. That's them going out and exploring seeing what's out there and seeing that they can handle it. Um, providing guidance. I'd see this as a DM's role as far as like, especially if you have new players and they're not sure how to play, um, you know, where to look on their character sheet, what to roll, what to add, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and then enhancing retention and transfer. I think someone mentioned story a while ago. <clears throat> that to me... I, I enjoy playing Dungeons and Dragons. But to me, the real joy is when something so crazy happened that when you tell other people, you can see in their eyes that they want to play too. And that can even happen with people that don't play D&D. But it's mainly people that get it that already play. And they're like, like if I play Curse of Strahd and I say, yeah, we, you know, we, there was this crazy um woman and she read my tarot cards and she told me this and then i went and i fought the vampire and i'll be like yeah that's what happens when you play curse of strat thanks for telling me my own experience and everyone it's an episode right but <clears throat> playing with this complete player autonomy the story isn't there waiting for them to discover the story emerges from the style of play and it's compelling because they know it's theirs it's all over them um let me see if I can find another quote from the player's handbook. It's the superior alloy quote. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to find it in time. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to, I'll have to look it up later. Uh, but basically where I lost you guys. Oh, there we are. I still don't see my air meat. Oh, <laughs> you're in another tab. Okay. <clears throat> basically Gary says that the world you create will be a superior alloy of the best ideas of your best players, the ones that are most active and take the world most seriously. And it's something that you can't buy on a shelf. It's something that you guys just sit down together and make together. So <clears throat> bringing it home, bringing it all home, you pontificating nerd, J-Rock, telling people they're playing wrong, and just using this learning and development session to just yak on and on about Dungeons and Dragons ad nauseum. <clears throat> What's the whole point? Well, here's my conceit. Now, when it comes to the railroad, the, the Dungeons and Dragons version of that is the published module where the story is more important than the campaign or the world or the players. And I liken that to standard conventional e-learning where it's Tell, 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 test. In game terms, that would be <clears throat> plot point, plot point, plot point, boss fight, right? Where the, the test at the end is like, did you assemble all the MacGuffins to get the stuff you needed to fight the big bad? Whereas the sandbox version, it's not a published module. It may be a published setting or one you created, but <clears throat> you just have 
you have terrain you have dwellings you have monsters and the characters can travel around it and they kind of set their own goals for what they want to do and then interact with the world the story emerges from the setting and i liken this to the branched path scenarios that we were talking about when we were like what are the best e-learnings that we've ever played um it wasn't on the rails like a telltale test <clears throat> we got thrown in the situation we had to make decisions whether we had the information or not we could go for the information or we could just wing it and see what happened and we got the consequences and to me that is so much more compelling and then my third my bro sr version my grand campaign uh, a randomly generated world that may actually be randomly generated while the players are at the table. Even the DM gets to be surprised by what the story is. And as far as e-learning, uh, this is a question. This may be where we're heading. Let me know what you guys think. <clears throat> Responsive generated AI scenarios. Where you can use generative text like chat GPT-4 and you can create an e-learning that hooks in to a, a system for randomly generating the answers to the questions and stuff. And I mean, you're, you're gonna have to be careful how you build it because you want you definitely wanna put some rails on there, right? Because with AI, who knows where it could go? You wanna keep it tied to the learning. Um, but I think that's what's coming. And in fact, I got accepted to give a talk at ATD next year about generative AI and branch path scenarios. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe a little D&D comes out when I go to talk about it. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> so I'm running out of voice. That's pretty much all I've got for you guys. Um, if you're interested in this, um, I have a YouTube channel uh, called at Dunder Moose. <clears throat> so back when I was I was joining with the Bro SR, there was a guy who was he was in the OSR and he felt threatened because he sells a lot of modules. And the Bro SR said, you know, we don't need any modules. You just need the three original books. He got really mad at Jeff Rowe, and he started. He did that thing where you go back and you try to find someone's tweets and take them out of context. And he said, this guy is an anti semite, and if you play this way, you are too. And he was calling all of us that, and I was like, you know what? My boss doesn't even play Dungeons and Dragons. I do not want that to be a topic of conversation in my next one on one. So at that point, I just said, on my, because my Twitter is at John Rock, at J O N R O C K. I just said, all right, guys, uh, I'm not doing any more Dungeons and Dragons stuff here. I split them. I have another Twitter that's at Dunder Moose. <clears throat> that's where I argue about DD &D with people. And John Rock is where I do all my LD stuff, and never the twain shall meet unless someone happens to find this video and then I'm out, right? But if you wanna see me interviewing, um, I was on Twitter and I was like, man, I wish I was a talented YouTuber so that I could ask you guys that have been doing this stuff, these questions. And one of them was a guy named Rick Stump. He's not a bro SR guy, but he has been playing a continuous campaign of first edition Dungeons and Dragons for 44 years. It has never stopped. Every week, 44 years. And he said, you should do it and I'll be your first guest. And I was like, okay, <clears throat> let's do this. So I've got like 10 episodes up. I have been interviewing people that are in this world. It's usually, I, I try for an hour, but usually it's about two and a half. As you can see, I go over when I'm talking about this stuff. But if you're interested, uh, youtube.com slash at Dunder Moose. <clears throat> and um, I'm not great at YouTube. It's pretty rough like my voice is now. Um, if you're interested in, in books about this stuff, I'm going to click on this one first. Uh, this is not the full book. This is a this is one of the chapters in a forthcoming book, but it's called How to Win at D&D. And Jeffro wanted to get it out there so people got a taste. It doesn't have any of the uh, the wrestler stuff or the, you know, the memes. It's it's just a pretty straightforward explanation of uh, how this game is played. And you can get it at Pelham Press. I don't know if that's Pilum or Pelham Press. Um, <clears throat> then the other book that Jeff Rowe, uh, created, I have my Amazon link here. Um, it's not mine, like it's not affiliate or anything. Uh, but here's his book, um, on appendix N where he just goes through, um, all of the stuff trying to give me a coupon. He goes through all of the stuff that was in that culturally that we lost when we stopped reading these, these books that were written before 1980. 
And then another one uh, that I want to show you is Arbiter of Worlds. I actually have that one here. <clears throat> a guy named Alexander McCreese. I interviewed him recently. This is, if you want to get into simulationist gaming as a DM, uh, this is the book to read for that. He is a genius on that. Um, he, he has his own game called Adventure of Conquer, or King System. He's coming out with a second edition of it, and it is on Kickstarter right now if you want to get in on that. Um, and I also interviewed him on my on my YouTube channel. So those are some resources. Um, what do you think, Luis? Shall we open it for some questions or or what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Man, that was amazing, dude. That was like, that's crazy. I um, this I hope is, I didn't hurt anybody's feelings. No, well, no, of course not. The, you know, it's funny. The whole time I'm thinking about how. Like my son, my nine year old, he like reads D and D books. Like he's read at least a dozen, and he is just a hardcore five E kid, right? That's yeah. what he knows. Subclasses, all that. I mean, listens to the podcasts, all this stuff. He's really into the Dungeon Dudes. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen those guys. He knows he knows five E really, really well. And so when we try to play, I'm still stuck stuck in one E, and it's all about story to me. And, yeah. and, and it's so funny because then when we play together, but he's got all of the, you know, he's got all the reference points that he has to like yeah. hit me up for all these different extra things that have to have to happen. I'm like, and I get lost because like the story is what I, it's all about. It's always been about to me. Yeah. So, my first guest, uh, Rick Stump, he, he, he summed it up like this. He said, there's two types of players. When you come across a situation, there's players that look down on their sheet to see what they what they can do, right? And fifth edition has all the skills and stuff, kind of primes you for everything being a D20 roll. He said, then there's players that when they come up with a situation, they look up and try to think, what am I going to do in this situation? Yeah. You want to be the latter. <clears throat> and you want to play a system that encourages that. No, totally agree. Totally agree. I love it. Um yeah, any any questions from anybody out there? I know there's it's still a good handful of us out. Still William the says uh, the secret is safe with us, so I'm glad to hear that, man. Thanks for letting me go a half hour over and sticking with us, guys. Look at this. <laughs> we got 15 people. This is definitely the longest session ever in TLDC history, and definitely <laughs> the nerdiest, the nerdiest. And I was you want the longest nerdiest session? Get the biggest nerdiest nerd. <laughs> I love it. No, it's so great. It's so great. Um, and and hopefully, yeah, and Don is still here. That's good. I think that, you know, it, what's really, you know, with this whole community, I would, like, now I want to see, like, some of you rock stars, like, get together and play a game. Like, I would love to see, like, you and Don and, and Tom McDowell. Oh, I mean, and it would just be fun just, just to have it. And um, so... I you have know, fun to play with Matt Pierce. Um, he's he's a forever DM. He doesn't yes. ever get to play as a player. So when he is a player, he gets up to some shenanigans. He likes to pickpocket people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, no, we had a conversation. <laughs> I, he talked my ear off about D and D when I just saw him last week in in Las Vegas because he yes. was talking about the the uh, the campaign that he's been running for a couple of years with with, with his coworkers. So it was it was pretty funny. But um, yeah, that's it. We've. I think that we should wrap it up, and 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 thank you so much for doing this. You got it, man. I, it was know, like when you first asked me, I was like, "Am I going to have enough to talk about?" <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, do where do you go to talk about this stuff with anybody? Do you? Have, is it just on Twitter and stuff? Or yeah, I go on Twitter, and um, <clears throat> so. So my critical role was reading Jeff Rowe's blog, reading about what happens in Trilopolis. And at one point on Twitter, I just mentioned playing in Trilopolis is on my gamer bucket list. And he saw it and he invited me in. So everybody in that game is, is a DM in their own right. So I'm learning a ton from all the players and they all know first edition. I had never played first edition before. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm still very much a Johnny come lately to this stuff. <clears throat> I just, I think it's interesting how some of the problems I was having with 5e are solved by adding extra rules. Instead of being rules light, it's rules tight. Yeah. And because we got to get our stuff and get out of the dungeon by the end of the night, we can roll next week with whoever's here and it's not even a conversation. 
Yeah. Right yeah. So it's like a balancing out thing. That's awesome. Um, but yeah. yeah, so I'm on I'm on there. He was on Twitter. He was doing it only on Twitter, but then he got kicked off Twitter because he said something like low fantasy is dumb. I don't know why that got him kicked off Twitter for some of the doozies that he's dropped on people. Um, Cause these guys really are bullies. They're like all aggressive Catholic paladins, every single one of them. <laughs> it's some of them are Orthodox, but <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, so I, you, they, they don't do actual plays. They do session reports. So after we play a session in Trilopolis, usually like the next day or two days later, the DM will post on the blog and write up what happened. And that's kind of fun to go back and relive as you read through it again as well. And then link to it for your friends and stuff. Wow, I'm gonna have to check that out. This is great. All right, well, let's give our uh, throats yeah, rest. Running, Wendy. Yep, yeah. exactly. So thank you guys so much for being here and letting us nerd out about this stuff. Yeah. Um, this is, I think I think you have done something that's absolutely unique in the field this week, oh, Luis. Definitely. You know, and the funny thing was, was last week when I, when I was at the conference, I got so many comments from people. They're like, what are you really, you know, are you really doing that? And I'm like, yeah, man. Let's I'm go, like, baby. Yeah, exactly. And it was, I've been, it was, people been making fun of me for this my whole life. You think you're going to stop me? <laughs> I love it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Thanks everybody. Thank we'll see you yeah. tomorrow. Um, We've got another really, really strong day. At least I think we have seven sessions tomorrow, maybe. But um, anyway, we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thanks again, J-Rock. Yeah. Um, see you have later. Have fun with your fake D&D. &D. <laughs>